Hi, welcome back. In this, the last of my five sessions on discount rates, I'd like to clear up some misconceptions that have become deeply entrenched, I think, in the way we think about discount rates, especially in these last few years of low interest rates. So let's step back and think about how risk-free rates, or those low interest rates, play out in a typical discounted cash flow valuation. If your way of estimating discount rates is like mine, you start with the risk-free rate and you build up. You add an equity risk premium to get to a cost of equity and a default spread to get to a cost of debt. You weight them by a debt ratio to come up with the cost of capital. So if you follow that reasoning, then if I lower the risk-free rate, holding all else constant, my cost of equity and cost of capital come down, right? And if I hold all else constant, lower discount rate will translate into a higher value. In fact, if I keep going down this path, as my risk-free rates go to zero and below, they're after all negative risk-free rate currencies, my valuations could potentially hit sky-high numbers and perhaps go to infinity. So it's this line of reasoning that has led some people to argue that in these days of really low, near-zero interest rates, you cannot really do discounted cash flow evaluation anymore. In fact, the best way of illustrating how this logic works is to think about how interest rates play out in this system, the static world that I just described. Usually it's a central banker who has the power in this, in this world to set rates. So the Fed lowers rates. How does it do it? That's, not, that's left unspecified. Let's say the Fed does have the power to lower rates. And it lower rates, equity risk premiums and default spreads stay fixed, and the cost of equity and the cost of debt come down. The cost of equity and the cost of debt come down, the cost of capital comes down. The cost of capital comes down and the cash flows and growth rates stay the same, the value goes up. You think, what can go wrong with this logic? It sounds impeccable. Well, let's step back and think about what how this plays out in numbers. If I take a firm, and let's say the firm has a fixed cash flow, $100 million in cash flows, and a fixed growth rate, 10% for the next five years, and 4% beyond that in the cash flows and I change the risk-free rate in this process. So let's say initially I try a 4% risk-free rate and I keep risk premiums the same and the, the default spread's fixed and I estimate the value. Then I revalue the company with 3.5% risk-free rates and 3% risk-free rates. Remember, my cash flow stays at 100 million, my growth rate stays at 10% for the next five years and 4% beyond. My risk premium and default spread stay the same. As my risk-free rate goes down, not surprisingly, my value shoots through the roof. In fact, I had to stop at a half a percent risk-free rate because if I lower the risk-free rate to 0%, at least in this world, the value would have gone to infinity. And if it goes to negative numbers, you clearly can't even operate in this world. So let's see what the, the problem in this static world is, where the logic breaks down. And to understand where the logic breaks down, I'm going to go in and contest every single piece of how that world was constructed, the static world. First, I don't believe that the Fed or central banks set rates. They tweak rates at the margin. So I'm going to talk about the fundamentals that drive rates and why central banks can't set rates at whatever number they want. Second, when interest rates change, they're changing because of fundamentals, because of economic conditions out there, which also affect risk premiums and growth rates and stay internally consistent. If you want to use the new risk-free rate, you've got to use the new growth rate, the new risk premiums that come with it. So holding all else constant might be the four most difficult words to, use, to utter in the context of valuation. And here's my basis for contesting every single one of those static assumptions. Let's start off by first looking at the relationship between risk-free rates and growth. This is actually a graph that I've used before to show the powerlessness of central banks. It sounds like a strange word to use, powerless central banks. But I think they're powerless because the fundamentals that drive risk-free rates and interest rates are real growth and inflation. So in this graph, I've actually graphed out the T-bond rate. That's actually the line graph. And I have the inflation rate each year. That's the yellow component of the graph. And on top of that, I've added on the real GDP growth each year. So essentially what I have is the actual T-bond rate and what I'm going to call an intrinsic T-bond rate composed of inflation and real GDP growth. Take a look at those two graphs. They look like they move together a lot of the time, right? And if you think about what's happened over the last decade, I think you've cracked the code on why rates have been low for much of the last 10 years. Inflation has been really low and real growth has been abysmal. 
Really low inflation plus abysmal real growth added together will give you low risk-free rates. The real reason interest rates have been low for the last decade or much of the last decade is not because of QE1, QE2. It's not because Fed funds rates are low. It's not because the Fed has willed the rates to be low. It's because the fundamentals have driven rates lower. I'm not suggesting the Fed has no effect on rates. Clearly they do, but the effect is at the margin. So the more important lesson, though, is when rates go down, both nominal growth and real growth often also have to go down. Here's the second link in the chain. If every, at the start of every month and for the start of every year, going back far longer, I've been computing an implied equity risk premium for the S&P 500. What is the implied equity risk premium? Basically, I take the level of the index, I get expected cash flows on, on buying the stocks in the index, and I solve for an internal rate of return. What is that telling me? It's telling me the rate of return investors are pricing into stocks. It's what I would call an implied cost of equity. In this graph, I've computed that number on an annual basis, that implied cost of equity, and compared it to the risk-free rate to come up with a risk premium each year. Take a look at what's happened since 2007. In 2007, the risk-free rate was roughly 4%. The expected return, the internal rate of return, the cost of equity, the implied cost of equity for stocks was about 8%. The equity risk premium was therefore 4%. The risk-free rate was 4%. The equity risk premium was 4%. Now take a look at 2016. The risk-free rate is down to 2%, right? You're saying, well, the expected return now must be now down to 6%. No, it's not. It actually has stayed at 8%. In fact, if you look over much of the last nine years, the expected return on stocks has stayed around 8%. So as risk-free rates have dropped, equity risk premiums have risen to compensate. And I think that makes sense, right? You're coming out of a crisis. Risk-free rates have dropped. People are more risk-averse. Equity risk premiums are the only instrument you have to reflect those fears you have about the market, and they've gone up. In fact, default spreads have also increased as risk-free rates have come down. If you take a look at 2007, for instance, the risk-free rate was 4.02%. The default spread on a BAA-rated bond, which is a pretty highly rated bond, is about 2%. Move forward 10 years, right? The risk-free rate has dropped, but the default spread has almost doubled. It's gone up to 3.5%. So as risk-free rates have come down, the price of risk in the bond market has also gone up just as it has in the equity market. So nominal growth has changed as risk-free rates have changed. As risk-free rates have come down, nominal growth has come down, or nominal growth comes down, risk-free rates have come down. Risk premiums, both in the equity and the bond market, have changed. Here's the final piece of the puzzle. As risk-free rates have changed, companies have changed the way they fund themselves. These are market debt ratios and book debt ratios for U.S. companies going back to 2000. Again, if you look at the pre-2008 numbers and the post-2008 numbers, you notice a fairly significant shift. U.S. companies now use a lot more debt than they used to, and you can't use the simple rationale of, hey, rates are lower, that's what you'd expect. This reflects the fact that when rates are lower, both the cost of equity and the cost of debt come down, but debt is still a little more attractive than equity, at least in the environment we've seen ourselves in the last nine years. That's playing out as higher debt ratios. So let's review. In my original example and valuation, I left the cash flows fixed, I left the debt ratio fixed, I left the, the risk premiums and the default spreads fixed and changed only the risk-free rate. So when I did that, as the risk-free rate decreased, the value climbed towards infinity. In the world that I've just described, when I change the risk-free rate, the risk premium changes, the default spread changes, the growth rate changes. In fact, here's the way I modified the example that I showed you in the static example. In that, in that particular valuation, where I'd valued the company at a 10% growth rate for the next five years and 4% thereafter, with a $100 million cash flow, I'd left those numbers unchanged as I changed the risk-free rate. I'm going to get real here. As my risk-free rate decreases, I'm going to lower the growth rates. In fact, I'm going to let this company grow 4%, I'm sorry, 6% higher than the risk-free rate during the high growth phase, which means if my risk-free rate is 2%, I'm going to grow at 8% rather than 10%, and in steady state, I'm going to grow at only 2%. So my growth rates change as my risk-free rate changes. I'm also going to adjust my risk premiums to reflect what you saw in those two graphs. As my risk-free rate decreases, I'm going to increase my risk premium, both in equity and in the bond market. What do you get here? 
is a more dynamic reflection of what happens as risk-free rates change. And at least with the numbers that I used, as my risk-free rate goes from 4 to 05 percent, my value actually decreases a little bit. It doesn't increase. Now, of course, that's a function of the very specific assumptions I made about risk premium. But the bottom line is, if you ask me what would happen to values, to stock prices, if risk-free rates tomorrow drop to 1%, my answer is going to be, I don't know, because I'd have to work out what the effects are going to be on growth and risk premium before I can answer you. That's why if you're waiting for the Fed to act, first I would suggest that the Fed has a lot less power than you think it does. But even if it does have the power, the effects on stock prices are a lot more ambiguous than they look like because everything changes as the risk-free rate changes. So in the world that I'm going to describe, which is very different from the static world, here's what happens. When central bankers lower rates, things don't always work out the way they are expected to. Exchange rates might or might not move because other central bankers might lower rates as well. Cost of equity and cost of debt might go down or might go up, depending on what happens for risk premium. The values of companies might go down or might go up, depending on what fundamentals about the growth are being reflected in the risk-free rate. It's a much more interesting, much more dynamic world that you're looking at. So in looking at the effects on risk-free rates is therefore going to be always a little more messy than you thought it was. So let me close by playing devil's advocate. I'd like, I'd like to take apart my own arguments to see their weakest links. I know that a couple of you will come back to me, quite a few of you might come back to me with one of two arguments. The first is you might point out to the notion of mean reversion, that things revert back to the way they used to be. You're saying, look, my risk-free rate is 2%. I think it's going to revert back to 4%. Okay, I'll concede mean reversion to you. Though I'd warn you that mean reversion works best in systems where there's been no structural break. And if there's been a structural break in, in the interest rate model or system, well, you might not revert back to 4%. But even if you bought into mean reversion, you can't selectively assume mean reversion. In other words, if you assume mean reversion in risk-free rates, You'll also have to assume mean reversion in risk premiums and mean reversion in growth rates. Put differently, you're going to be valuing companies in 2016 as if everything looks like 2007. Well, good luck to you on that one. The other argument I will probably hear is perhaps I'm underestimating the power of central banks, that it is in fact central banking power that has driven rates lower, not the fundamentals. Okay, let's say that's true. If, in fact, these rates are artificially low, I would still argue that in your valuation, if you, if you decide to go with these rates, you're also implicitly telling me that since they're artificially low, they'll revert back to 4% to 3.5% or 5% or whatever you think is normal, which means you have to bring in the effects of those changes into all of your inputs. In other words, you can't assume that an artificial lowering in the risk-free rate doesn't alter all of the other numbers in your valuation. Perhaps there is a combination that you can point to me that would suggest there's a bubble in markets. I don't see that because for the bubble to be created, here's what's got to happen. As the risk-free rate goes down, investors should be blind to the fact that it's artificially low and should also be bringing down their, co their cost of equity. That's not what you're seeing. You're not seeing the expected return drop from 8 to 6% as the risk-free rate goes from 4 to 2%. So maybe the market's smarter than you think it is. Maybe we need to give credit to markets where it's due. 